think we are recording. Um, hello and welcome to anybody who is watching. We are gathered together today to have our first meeting to really talk about diving into a process that's been on its way for about a year. Um, I know I just said first meeting for something that's been on its way for a year, but um, we are talking about developing partners to develop resources to build out Creating the Future to uh, accomplish our mission. I'm Hilde Gottlieb with Creating the Future. And um, if you guys would like to just do a quick go around and um, tell us your name and where you're located. I am I am right now sitting in very warm for February, Tucson, Arizona. Um, Rebecca, how about you? Hello, Rebecca Hurd. I'm in McCall, Idaho, and I am knee deep in the snow as we love it here for about six months every winter, a small mountain town in the West Central Mountains of Idaho. And, and when you say knee deep, that means there's more coming because it will soon be shoulder deep. <laughs> yes, yes. Winter is young here. <laughs> <laughs> and Anne Vermel. I'm Ann Vermel, and I'm in Fresno, California, where we have had a lot of, of schmutz in the air. But other than that, uh, it's a lovely sunny day. <laughs> How nice. And Shiva. I'm Shiva Berman. I'm in Lafayette, California. Sunny, gorgeous day. Yay. And Laura Steffen. Hi, I'm joining you from Portland, Oregon, where it's um, overcast, but not too cold. Always nice. Always, always nice. I was realizing as we were getting together that all of us are on the west coast of the U.S. in, in this particular meeting, so uh, makes time zones certainly easy. Um, the work that we are embarking on here has been, um, like I said, coming for a year in discussions, and uh, the diving in to take action is we're ready. We've been planning for about a year and putting the pieces into place. Um, and I thought it might be helpful to just give a little bit of history because people are always asking, um, why is creating the future not doing active fundraising? Um, and because as, as we have constant conversations about things, they eventually will say, well, what's your budget? And what do you mean you're not taking a salary? And is this because this is a cute little volunteer activity for you? And um, et cetera, and et cetera. And uh, the answer is first, no, this is not a cute little volunteer activity. Um, unless you count 60 to 80 hours a week um, for three of us, Rebecca, me, and Dimitri, um, as, as cute little volunteer things. Um, the history of creating the future came from an idea, came from the what we have come to call catalytic thinking, the framework that really helps bring out the best in people in any situation. And um, the, the mission of creating the future is over the next 10 years to see how much more humane the world can be through systems change rooted in systems that bring out the best in us. And we all know and have encountered systems that bring out the worst in us. We change the questions those systems are answering. And instead of reactive questions that bring out the worst in us, if those systems were bringing out the best in us, what would that look like and what would that look like in the world? Well, one of the systems that brings out the worst in us is systems that have to do with money. And early on in this conversation, and Anne, I think you might have been part of the conversation back in 2010, maybe, um, where we were talking about the fact that creating the future was going to need resources. And yet, if the vision we have for the world is an equitable place to live, where everyone is valued for who they are and not what they have, do we really want to walk into situations where we were approaching funders, for example, um, where there is that power dynamic of we have the money, therefore we make the rules. Did we want to walk into those situations and apply for funding using their rules so that we could change that system and talk to them about not having those rules? And that it just, it, it, it felt so incongruous. It felt so, it just felt wrong. Um, it just it just felt yucky. And so the decision was made back then that whenever we sought resources, we would do it through that sense of collective enoughness, that we all have wonderful gifts to share, that together we have everything we need. 
and that we would look to engage people as real partners in our work and not the silent financial partners that um, when, when we talk about partnering for grants, we're really talking about silent financial partners where um, a foundation will, uh, you know, we'll, we'll beg for money and the foundation will grant us money. Um, many foundations just have, have umbrage even at the word. <laughs> it's lovely. And <laughs> the word grant us money. Um, and, but they're not really partners and they don't want a partner. They don't want to be part of it. They just, you know, maybe give us a report. We promise we won't read it. Um, <laughs> and, and that's pretty much it. And nothing moves past that. So what one group learns isn't shared. And, you know, we're, we're all doing the same work that we did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and, and not a lot is changing and many people think things are getting dramatically worse day by day. Um, and we didn't want to be part of that. We understood that that meant we were stepping into something that we didn't know what it was. We understood that, um, and at the time, this was just Dimitri and me and Rebecca coming on two, three years ago. We understood that, in essence, we were self-funding, and that, um, and that that was by design. And some of the things that we learned along the way with that um, was that creating the future is not like a food bank, where there's already a bank of funders waiting to give for poverty and homelessness and individuals in need and, and basic needs. Um, creating the future is an idea. And there's not a lot of funders lined up to do that. So had we decided to go against our values and to, to submit a whole bunch of grants and please, please give us money, we, we A, would have really been fighting because we didn't, we hadn't, didn't have a track record yet. Um, we, we were young. The, the, this organization started forming in 2011. We had our first board meeting. We, didn't, we weren't a 501c3 until 2013 um, and didn't really have a track record. We didn't start teaching any classes until 2009 and, and didn't have anything to show for it and, uh, at, for quite a long time after that. It had individual stories, but you didn't have a bank of all of this evidence. So you're, you're based on a theory, you're based on a, on, on a, a concept, um, you got an idea of where it's gonna go, you've got a, a goal, um, you've got individual stories, but you don't have a lot of thrust behind you. And so therefore, you know, what can you get? You can get a $5,000 grant maybe that says, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll give it a shot, but you're not gonna get an infusion that's going to give you what you really need. And then you wind up on that hamster wheel, which winds you back in terms of, of our values. And so everything kept colliding and saying, this is just not a good idea. Um, the the, the self-funding, um, as we look back and realize that that's what we were doing, is we were either lending money to pay bills, we were lending our expertise, um, operations were funded through whatever cash flow through our education programs. Um, and all of that is self-funding. And what that did was it gave us the time where now we've got an amazing track record and an amazing story to tell. And we've got something to invite people to be part of. And whether they are social investors, whether they are foundations, whether they are government partners, demonstration partners, um, there's a there there. We can tell them this is what we are. This is where we're going, and we have not only done the research, but we've been experimenting for, for going on eight years, um, and, and this is what you will be partnering with us, and here's what we bring. And so there's, there's a real difference there, and right now feels right. Um, right now feels right to say, um, okay, it's time, let's start pulling the story together and engaging people in conversation so that we can find partners who want to play and who want to learn alongside us and grow alongside us and experiment alongside us and, um, and explore within their own organizations maybe or with their own friends and colleagues and clients. However it works, we don't know. 
Um, but I, I thought it would be helpful to just give that sort of little bit of, of um, history. Frequently, um, many of you who are um, are watching for the first time and, and haven't experienced a meeting at Creating the Future frequently, um, we start our meetings by telling a little bit about the winding path that has brought each of us into the room. And actually, before this meeting, we just did that um, so that everyone here would get to know each other a little bit. But I thought it would be helpful to talk a little bit about the winding path of, um, of gathering resources at Creating the Future, because that really is, is our, um, our story that brings us into the room today. Um, we were very, very blessed about a year ago with a, um, a woman who has done a significant amount of fundraising, working with foundations over many, many years, She's sitting right there, Anne Vermel, um, who has been a fellow at Creating the Future and a friend of mine personally for a very long time, saying, um, I'd like to help with this. Let's pull something together. And so um, Anne and Rebecca and I have been meeting um, pretty regularly for maybe nine months or so to do some planning and say, okay, what is this? What are we actually talking about? What are we looking for resources for? Um, what phases make sense to talk about? And what are the pieces, parts, um, which has been very, very joyful. And that has been happening coincide with, um, with the conversations the board has been having, which I'll talk a little bit about in, in a bit. Um, about what Creating the Future will eventually be. Um, Laura joined us about a month ago and um, is sharing her skills and, and love of creating systems and um, for us in particular in the form of, of real systems, not, not theoretical systems, but databases and places to put stuff. Um, which, you know, I, I was um, laughing the other day, Rebecca and I were talking about something and she said, you know, when you're starting something new, there's, there are no systems in place. <laughs> so um, that is joyful, um, delightful to have Shiva joining us from um, your extensive fundraising background. And, um, and what's fun from the fundraising background, um, especially both, both you and it, Rebecca's got a really solid fundraising background as well, come to think of it. <laughs> Um, um, the, the Philadelphia Orchestra is no small potatoes. Um, the, the, the willingness of, of you guys all to step in and say, I know this is going to be different. Um, and, and that's what's intriguing and that's what's fun. So I'm, I'm grateful to you guys. Um, anything anything that, you, that you would add, Rebecca and, and um, Anne, as I've been sort of blabbing here about what this is for folks who are watching? Uh, I just I'd like to think a, a nod to and, and there's much more for people to go learn and explore about when we say we've got the stuff of what we mean when we got the stuff. You know, we are this experiment. We have been working, uh, working so very hard with so many people who've been sh you know documenting, learning, sharing constantly. We are beta forever. There is no we're no longer. And that's the beauty of what it, the experiment is that we're so very proud of all that we've learned and all that we already have in place and all of the countless hours of planning meetings on what would good look like and what would it take is documented and it's documented down to we know the systems we would need to have in place and we know so much of that is also in the resourcing of human beings who want to be a part of this so i just i delight with confidence in all that we have at this point so and and as the archivist, um, <laughs> I know what's in those minds. <laughs> it's it's going to be really really fun to have a system, a real like live system online. <laughs> we don't have to rely on Rebecca being the archivist. <laughs> well, an amazing thing too about about having reached this this stage is the fact that. We've all known that we have this incredible kind of wonderful thing, which Rebecca calls stuff. <laughs> <laughs> there's the thing, and then there's stuff, <laughs> and uh, and and I keep I keep having this impulse that wants to say, don't you understand that if people could just hear each other when they talk, if they could just ask questions that brought out the best in each other. If they could just realize that they're fine and that it's going to work because the wisdom's in the room, you know, 
and don't you understand that? But after the nine months that we've been poking around at this, we've actually come to a point where we can start telling exactly that story, where we can say, now we've got, we're asking you to look at this and say, we've got a framework that works and it will help you do what you want to do. And that, that's been, uh, it's been sort of a groping process, but it's been kind of amazing. And, uh, and it has resulted in exactly what, what it should have. And I think you're right, Shiva. I think at this point in, in the history of the world, and I, I don't think just the United States is suffering, um, it's really important work that we're talking about. It's, it's, um, uh, I, I, I come from a, a background of, of people who were very, very disinclined to grandiosity. Unfortunately, grandiosity was my birth name, but, um, the fact is that I really believe this could change the world and that's really what I want to see happen. So. Thank you. And, 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 you know, and really think about movements and uh, what kind of movements are successful. Timing is obviously um, very important when there is that felt need that the time for change is now. But I also think there is, it has to be relevant to the general public, right? And this is something that's really relevant to the general public because we can all do better if the best of us comes out. Mm -hmm. And it, there is a broader story here. It's not a story of, you know, one small group of people. It's a broader story of a challenge that humanity faces. We all face this. Yeah. And there is something that we all need to overcome, something we all need to aspire to and take on as a challenge. And that, you know, when, when you have those things, it also makes it desirable to uh, others who can tell your story, right? The media can pick up your story and tell it. The people can pick up your story and tell it because they see themselves in that story. And I think that's one of the amazing things about what's happening at creating the future and where things are at now. That accessibility that you're talking about is, is, um, is so germane. I mean, the, the fact that catalytic thinking is a, a is a framework that can be used by anyone anywhere. I think you actually said that a few minutes ago, Hildy. But if I talk to uh, a, the man down the street who helped me with my neighbor this morning, who is the most incredible racist bigot I've ever met, mm. but he was in tears this morning, and um, and I was able to really apply the, the catalytic thinking to him and I could get him to see how how much love he had and for him to just walk away with that sense I don't know where it'll go with him but at least I felt I felt okay we, we've broken a, a barrier here I mean I know you're a racist bigot you know I'm a, a, a flaming liberal so we can still talk <laughs> and and my daughter is now using catalytic thinking much less deeply than, than I would like to see, than I expect will happen, uh, just to keep her relationships. It, it really, it's, it, you know, Rebecca's favorite expression, you know, this shit works and it works everywhere. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, we have had, um, we have had problems over the past two weeks with our website hosting. Uh, any of you who have tried to get onto our website in the past two weeks may have found it anywhere from deathly slow to non-existent. Um, Dimitri is one of the most mellow humans I've ever met, but when his patience is eventually tested, he will snap. And it takes a very long, you've got a really long fuse, which is why we're very good together, because I can challenge that fuse at any moment. And, um, but he will eventually snap. And I sat in the other room. Last week, the website was entirely down. It was entirely down entirely because our website hosting company made several big mistakes, um, some of which they then charged us to, to encouraging us to do the wrong thing 
um, charged us for it and then said, well, that wouldn't work. Why would you do it? Well, maybe because of this email you sent us telling us to do it and you, you start, you can feel the blood boiling. And, and my, my anger level, I've got a flash temper. My anger level was I was in the other room. I was going for lots of walks and I heard Dimitri using catalytic listening at every point and I could hear his tone going up. I could hear him <laughs> wanting to kill, you know, I know his tone and could hear him, but it was just so interesting to listen to the questions that he was asking, even as he was really seethingly angry um, about something that was very dangerous. I mean, it was, you know, we, we've got, we've got uh, university students who um, use our website as classes. We've got a classroom <laughs> space set up where an entire university class is taking one of our classes online and they couldn't get to it. They had an assignment. They couldn't get to it. Dimitri's like that. And yet I'm still hearing the questions coming out that are allowing somebody to at least be moderately human on the other end of the phone. Um, because the, the, what happens when we push at somebody is they move back. So if somebody pushes at me, I'm going to move back. I'm not going to come into their view. I'm not going to embrace them. I'm going to want to get the hell out of there as fast as I can. And um, the fact that he was held during, you know, so in terms of this works everywhere, if it works with your, your cable hosting, your, your, your website hosting, yeah. It's a, a yeah. Thing. So, um, Rebecca, any, any thoughts for, for the world before we move in onto the agenda? Well, just I, I'm thinking the fact with catalytic thinking is it does, it's that sense of relief and sense of hope to see here's what's really going on in systems all around us. And when we say systems, that's like, what's the dynamic and the norms that you're in your family? You know, that PTA meeting, how do people interact when they're in the grocery store in your community, all the way to like workplace systems and other ways. So I, I, the power in seeing here's what's really going on and the relief that you get as a human being to see. It's not me. It's not, you know, I'm at my worst and so is everyone else around me, but I can actually see what is going on. And to be able to hold up current systems versus, you know, what could be possible that there is a new go-to way of being instead of like, don't do that, don't do that, and, and don't do that, or here's a tip and trick that will make everything magical for you, like little silver bullets that people will glom onto because they don't like what they see. Yet with catalytic thinking, it is helping you understand the science of our brains and what's going on. You, you can't uh, say any other way. If this is the brain in a reaction mode, oh, okay, I can see what's happening. I can feel it in myself or see it in someone else. And that's, I guess, what we all feel together, the power and wanting to share this with whoever wants to be our partner is you will learn. And you will have change in every piece of your life alone, let alone what we're going to do together in the world. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's um, that's what's really exciting about our um, seeking partners is that uh, we mean partnership in the, in the truest sense um, that we, we want to be growing together, learning together. Part of our mission is to, to learn, to document what we learn, to share what we learn so that everybody else can learn too. And um, the, the thought as, as we look for partners in that is we're very intentional. It's, 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 part of, of what's undergirding this conversation, this first conversation and, and moving on. Um, we're very intentional that in this phase, we want to partner with people who are, um, who we can, we can leverage every action um, for the greatest impact. So um, partnering with folks who are influencers, partnering with folks who have influence in their sphere um, whether it is throughout their community, their region, um, through um, the fact that they fund many, many organizations in many, many places and could have fingers from all of the organizations that they come in contact with, then using these frameworks to do their work and asking questions differently. Um, it's one of the reasons that when um, years and years and years ago, when this wasn't even creating the future, it was just Dimitri and me teaching stuff, we initially started teaching this to consultants 
was because of the ripples. Because for every, every consultant we would teach, they would work with 10 organizations, 20 organizations, 50 organizations. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for partners right now that want to play, want to bring to the table what they have, and we will bring to the table what, what we have um, so that the ripples are huge. Um, and, and again, we know that small actions, it's why we call it catalytic thinking. Small actions can create huge results if we're thinking about it um, through that lens of catalytic thinking. And so thinking about people who are influencers, uh, people who can make ripples happen very, very quickly. Um, let's, let's talk about um, really two things. Um, accomplishing our mission, as I said, means walking the talk of that mission in absolutely every way. Um, including how we build out the structure that's going to accomplish the mission. And so I thought it might be just helpful to, to um, walk through a couple things um, because what we're talking about really is, is walking the talk of our values in the structure that we build that will carry the mission forward and how we resource that. And so um, spending a little bit of time on what is that structure and spending a little bit of time on, on how will we resource that um, and, and, and the approach that, that we'll be taking. Does that feel okay for you guys? Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Do I want to share? No, I'm going to. Um, the mission of creating the future, as, I'm, as I mentioned, is... Um, systems change. Systems change to create systems that are more, more humane uh, because understanding that systems are the answers to questions. Um, systems are answer, the answer to questions of what should we do? Um, how do we make sure that, how do, we, how do we make sure people don't do bad things? How do we make sure that good things happen? Um, what should we do? Um, systems are the answers to questions. And so if the questions that we're asking is are, um, how can we make sure you don't do something bad? That's not going to bring out the best in anybody. If systems instead are asking what will bring out the best in everyone, it's a different question. Um, and so the systems change that we're looking at is embedding more effective questions, questions that bring out the best in us into the systems we all encounter in our day-to-day -day lives. And whether that is at the cable company <laughs> when you call for tech support or whether that is in your relationship, um, whether that is, is with a foundation who may be in a conversation about partnering. Um, what, what, that, that's the kind of systems change we're looking at. There are three core tenets um, in, that at the root of creating the future's work, which are the three tenets at the root of catalytic thinking. One is that life is cause and effect, that our power to create powerful results, our power to create change, lies in our power to create causality, to create favorable conditions in the direction that we want to go. Um, the second is that the most favorable conditions we can create are about people and not about stuff. And so many of the systems we encounter are about stuff and not about people. Um, I, you know, we frequently joke and talk internally about if you, if you look at words like the war on poverty, the war on drugs, uh, the war on crime, um, those aren't how can we make sure everyone is safe and healthy. Those are crime. Those aren't how do we make sure that everyone has what they need, which is human. It is poverty. And so we've aimed at things and we wonder why things don't work. And so the most powerful um, favorable conditions we can create are about people. And then lastly, um, the, the, the economic principle of collective enoughness, which is that together we have everything we need. And so if we are looking through the lens of scarcity, we're not going to bring out the best in anybody. Um, we are certainly not going to bring out the best in ourselves. Um, if we look through the lens that together we have everything we need, we will be bringing out the best in people and we'll be creating a causality based on those favorable conditions. And so that is, that is really at the heart of our work. And um, anyone who is watching um, and, and any of you guys, if you haven't seen last year, our board adopted a statement of our values in action, which really puts those core tenets into action. This is, here's what they look like on the ground. Um, and it, and it includes things like, um, we're not going to get into transactional relationships. 
um, you, you have all experienced are saying, if you can't afford one of our classes, talk to us. Um, we never want money to stand in the way of somebody being able to take a class or do something. We, we, that's, that's how nitty gritty we believe in not having transactional relationships. Um, and, and so certainly when it comes to resourcing, again, those relationships are so transactional so often. Um, I, I, I bristle at the term donor acquisition. I mean, you want to talk about a thing. <laughs> we need to acquire more. Um, Do you see Anna and I laughing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and, and then, then my favorite, and I, so I'll talk, I'll talk to the two of you. Um, my favorite is when um, uh, uh, fundraising geeks um, talk about the coding that goes into the systems. So, so mm -hmm. the lie bunts and the, and the mm -hmm. last year, but not this year actually has a, like, yeah. Yeah. Just suit me. Just, well, just. I do still like the word donor, let alone donor acquisition. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's so much wrong with so much of it. <laughs> it's well, and, and so what's, what's been interesting is um, it led to, so I've talked a little bit about our, 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 our talking about um, about fundraising and about resourcing. The other interesting part of this is is all of that led to our um, asking the same sorts of questions about the organization itself. And um, you know, you guys know that we have been restructuring. We have been talking about what is this, and it's not really a restructuring because we didn't really have a structure. We've had a placeholder structure. Um, what is the organizational structure that will accomplish the mission that will create as much change in it as vastly spread out as possible, um, in, in 10 years. And we've known that it is not a hierarchical structure. So we know what it's not and, and really been asking what does good look like? Um, what, what would it be? And again, um, how often do we all encounter uh, organizational systems, whether it is um, community benefit, government, um, for-profit, where uh, people are fighting the systems. Where, and, and, and you know, I, I get it in a business, but, but right now we're focusing on community benefit. And if the system itself is actually thwarting community benefit, um, what, what, what have we created? Anne was talking earlier when we were talking about our winding paths about the fact that um, in my old days when I was doing a lot of, of training for nonprofits and community benefit organizations, um, I, would, I would ask the question, you know, do all of you know what your mission is? And they'd all say yes. And I'd say, and, and so tell me about your missions. And one would say it's about domestic violence and one would say it's about dogs and one would say, and I'd say, well, it sounds like all your missions are really different, right? And they would shake their heads and say, yes. And I'd say, no, they're not. Um, you all want the community to be a better place. And, and they go, oh, okay, yeah. And, and so after that, I would, I would always ask, so let's talk about what ultimate success would look like. What would 100% success look like? And eventually they would all get to, and they would say the same words. And, and many of you have been in rooms and have heard this. They would say, we, we might go out of business. If we have a system that makes us think those words about things being the best they can be, then we have created entirely, I mean, it, it's all ass backwards. The fact that, that, that it would take 15 minutes of intense conversation and the words that would arise is, wow, we might go out of business. And, and, and I frequently encounter people when we talk about our 10 year mission who say, yeah, I always think it's a good idea for nonprofits to put themselves out of business. No, let's talk about making the world the most amazing place it could be and sharing everything that we learn and and so we've created, you know, so when, when we talk about the fact that, that organizational structure and organizational systems have actually set us up to fail, um, they've set us up to silo, they've set us up to compete, they set us up for absolutely everything that makes us not effective. 
So we know it doesn't work. And we started to ask the question, what would a structure be that would accomplish our mission? Um, and that would not only accomplish it in 10 years, but would allow us to walk the talk of our mission, would propel us towards our mission while we're doing the work. That would actually be an example of accomplishing the mission right now, every day in the work that we're doing. What would it look like? What would it be? And so the board has spent a long time talking about that. Um, we have been talking with people who have done um, interesting work like this, trying to reimagine things along the way. Um, we have spent a year talking about our values because we knew that our values would have to be at the core of whatever we did. Um, we knew that um, a structure would need to adhere to the three tenets that I just talked about. Um, the structure itself would need to create causality towards the mission. Um, and, and it's so funny. You'd say, well, yeah, of course, until you think of all the structures that don't. Um, the structure itself would have to bring out the best in people. And you'd say, well, of course, until again, you realize how many of them don't. And um, the structure itself would have to be rooted in sharing resources. Um, and, and that means not just sharing internally, the, the thought that you've got an internal and an external, I mean, just sharing everywhere, that no matter what, the word is you're sharing. Um, that structure would have to be built around sharing. Um, as we have been investigating this and thinking about it and exploring it and talking to people, the thing that has the most excited me, and I'll just tell you guys this personally, is that historically the way nonprofit organizations have been structured is a knockoff of the business world. Is just, um, you know, because for the most part we're corporations and trusts, both of which are business kinds of entities. Um, but we're, we're structured the same. And so we've just sort of slapped on things that feel sort of community-ish. Um, but there has never been an organizational structure created mindfully with the deep intention to create social change. And that's the opportunity that we have. And that just like blows every piece of my skirt up. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very awesome. And so the, the question that we began asking is, okay, so, um, if this is about creating social change and not about creating organizations, then, um, what do you need an organization for? Um, you know, the, the very real question of if, if, if a bunch of people want to get together and feed people, what do you need an organization for? Um, if I have a, a, a great idea to use my, my carport um, to hand out clothing to people, what do I need an organization for? And um, the more we kept asking that question, it kept coming back to the same thing. People need organizations, um, you know, in, in the business world, a lot of organization is around create profit because you've got, it's basically the assembly line. <laughs> You're creating a machine to create profit. And uh, the organization in part is not only ensuring that the profit happens, but ensuring that you do your job um, because you're a widget in, in that machine, um, making sure, making sure, making sure. And what we realized is that um, in social change, people need organizations really for two things. One, they need to be able to find each other, whether that's to learn together, explore together, um, experiment together, um, bad ideas around together, um, people need each other. Um, they may need to help each other. They may need to, to support each other. Um, and the other thing that people need from organizations is resources. Um, the, the whole piece that together we have everything we need. Uh, because if there's 80 people working at a food bank individually, none of them have what they need, but you come together as an organization, they have resources, they have each other. Um, and really, when it comes to, to social change, that's really all we need an organization for. We don't need, um, because, and, and we've all experienced this, um, 
people in the field, people who are doing really amazing work, they know what they're doing. They may need each other to help train each other, um, but they don't need someone telling them, um, managing them, I guess is the word I'm trying not to use. <laughs> they don't need to be, they don't need to be led and they don't need to be managed. They need to be unleashed. Um, they need to be given the tools that bring out the best in them. They need to be supported. They need conditions for their success so they can go out and kick ass and make their communities better places. And so we've, again, created structures that manage them rather than unleash them. And, and so when we started to look at the question of what would a structure look like that um, allows people who are doing amazing work to do that work, um, they need the power to make decisions themselves. And they need to be able to find um, other people and resources. And so that is the structure that we have been working to create. And um, hopefully by June 30th, that is going to be in place. And I'm going to share my screen and hopefully... Um, things will come up as I am hoping they will. Okay, I think. Can you guys see both of these? Mission defined is what's up. Mission defined. Creating the future as a collection of people? Yes. Okay, so you're not seeing the purpose. Yeah, you're not seeing you're not seeing the bubbles. Nope. Well, I was hoping it would work, but it won't. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna stop the share and do it different. I was hoping it'd see them side by side, but that's all right. I'll do this one. All right. Um, we knew that local decision making would be some sort of hub and spoke kind of thing. Um, what? makes it interesting is that and I'm going to um, enlarge. Let's see if I can move this out of the way. There we go. Okay. Move that up, that down. All right. Um, again, the purpose of the organization being to create favorable conditions for the people doing the work. And so if we start with um, people doing some activity, let's call it activity A, whole bunch of people, and they're going to come together. And the thing that they will come together for is to connect with each other, connect with resources. And we know that all of their activities, and I'll, I'll shrink this down here. Um, there we go. All of that, their activities will be guided by catalytic thinking. So when they come together, when those people doing these activities come together, they're going to be um, using catalytic listening, using catalytic decision making, using collective enoughness, because that's what, if they're asking the same questions in the same way all the time, we know that our, va our values will be put into place. So in terms of the how do you, quote, make sure that everybody's doing what they, quote, should do, we don't have to because we trust catalytic thinking to bring out the best in the people and the situations to come up with amazingly creative ideas that will align behind our values. And so people will come together in these small hubs. Um, they're doing an activity. They'll connect with each other, and they'll connect with resources. Um, people in all of these different hubs – um, it just need to be what they, they don't need in the hub is to be led or managed. What they need is coordination. Somebody needs to, to coordinate the connection. Somebody needs to coordinate the connection to resource and to each other. And, and somebody needs to sort of guide a conversation and make sure that we're using catalytic thinking. But they need coordination. They don't need, need to be led and, and managed. So if all of those coordinators are coming together again to share, okay, well, we need to get together. We need to keep learning from each other. And we need to, you know, somebody in my, in my hub needed a resource and we don't have it. Do any of you have that resource? So the people in like kind activities who are coordinating different um, hubs 
will come together. And then finally at the center here in the orange will be all of the coordinators of all of the hubs coming together again, using catalytic thinking, connecting to each other and connecting to resources. And if the center, the, the question that, that kept coming up as we were um, exploring different options was we know it's gonna be hub and spoke, but what's at the center of the hub? Um, many people have been asking, so is this sort of like holacracy, if you're familiar with holacracy? Um, Tony Shea is, is probably the best example at Zappos um, instituting holacracy. And um, it's a distributed kind of, of um, network, uh, supposedly distributed leadership and distributed um, decision-making. But truly at the center of the hub is Tony, because he's the CEO. And if he decides tomorrow we're done with holacracy, or if he retires and they bring in another CEO who says, this was very cute, but we're not gonna do it, institutionally, that's not, it's a person at the center. It's a decision maker. Um, we've seen people say, well, the values need to be at the center. Um, okay, that's great. Um, what does that mean? Well, it's the board. Okay, so now you still got, <laughs> all right, so what does that mean? What we looked at is collective enoughness is at the center. That together we have everything we need. That we bring people together that we bring, we bring resources together. And if at the, at the core is making sure people have what they need to do the work they need to do, that's it. And so that could be uh, any kind of resources. It could be, um, do you know somebody who knows about blah, blah, because we're researching this? Great, okay, there's a whole research uh, component maybe. There's a lot of, of different, you know, there's a technology component because everybody's going to need technology. Um, all the kinds of resources that one might need would be at that center. Uh, the, the fun part for what's going to be flipping the switch, hopefully June 30th, is that rather than being at the top of the org chart, our board is going to be one of the resources that the organization's gonna need. Why? Because, and we've, we've seen this with a wonderful group in New Zealand called Inspiral, where they came up with a concept of a minimum viable board, which basically says, we've slapped all of these roles and responsibilities onto boards just to give them something to do, but what are they really legally need to do? And what boards need to do is, is make sure that we are in compliance. It's the board's responsibility legally because of, of corporate law um, to make sure that we're in legal compliance. Um, the, 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 you know, duty of care, duty of all of the fiduciary responsibilities, that's it. They're not legally responsible to make sure, and these are, these are my favorites, a, they're not legally responsible to fundraise, so stop saying that. Um, they're also not legally responsible for making sure the organization is carrying out its mission. If a food bank feeds three people every year and that's all they feed, it's not great. They won't raise lots of money, but, but a board is not legally um, responsible for making sure that you're doing the very, very best you can to accomplish your mission. So bringing it down to the minimum, what again, would somebody out in the field need? They'd need to know that if they want to go talk to somebody about fundraising, that our tax exemption is in, is in place. They'd need to know we're in legal compliance. And so what we're talking about is creating a board that is entirely about legal compliance as a support to the organization rather than pretending to lead the organization because that's what boards do they pretend to lead the organization uh, that's both for profit and nonprofit um, CEOs lead organizations and and spend a lot of time trying to bring the board along and so we're just sort of you know acknowledging reality um, as we were talking about before, talking about the stories we tell ourselves, um, the shoulds. Um, and, and so that's, I, I just wanted to sort of ground you guys in terms of, of um, what will this look like when it's fully built out? It will look like all of those hubs are active. 
that there's resource for anything that people want to be able to do, that some of it is going to be, uh, Laura, you've got a great idea and you want to bring it in and talk with a group of people. And, and you want to see how uh, being together with others who are doing similar kinds of things, great, that's a, that becomes a hub. And some of it might be our education programs that we're running ourselves. Um, again, people who are teaching immersion coming together around a hub and somebody would be coordinating them to make sure they have everything they need. Um, it doesn't matter what the thing is because again, it's not about the thing, it's gonna be about the people who are doing the work out there. Um, does that make sense to you guys as I'm rambling through it? Thoughts, what, what arises for you guys? Lots of questions. I mean, there, there are a lot of things that will have to be worked out as time proceeds. Um, I'm immediately, I've, I've just come from dealing with a, um, a founder issue. And, uh, and in, in this structure, as you've just described it, it's difficult to see who would be dealing with that issue. If, uh, uh, but gracious, I, I mean, to a degree, it would not be as severe an issue simply because catalytic thinking it guided everybody to that point, but it would still be an issue. Um, succession planning is another one. And, um, and then other than that though, it, it's, it's quite fascinating and as usual, it's, it's exciting because we don't know the answer. <laughs> Life as an experiment. You know, it, it, what's fun, Anne, is that um, when when we think about all of these various organizational things like succession and um, and founder issues and whatever else might come up, um, we we have this tendency to think from the reactive place of how do we address the founder issue? How do we address succession? We don't have a succession plan. How do we and Again, asking a completely different set of questions um, to ask things like, um, given that these are the kinds of things that frequently come up just in life, um, you know, how to, it, we deal with succession in our own lives. We just don't call it that. We call it a will. We call it a, you know, a living will. We call it power of attorney. We call it a, you know, does my kid know where the stuff is when I cork over? It, it, it's that kind of, it, it's succession planning. So if, if we think of it, instead of um, individual stuff that could happen, because then that's how we're trained to. That's, I mean, we're, we, we all know that stuff. All of us have been around this for too long. Um, and, and think of it instead of what are the supports that people would need and say, oh, okay, so then there would need to be supports for making sure that people are at their best, including a founder. Um, and nobody's gonna be at their best if there's no succession plan and one of our coordinators who knows absolutely everything is a not keeping it in their head because Laura's putting systems in place. Um, and, but again, are there systems in place? So it's not just in somebody's head. I mean, so it's, it's really fun to think about. And I, you know, I don't have answers. I, that's why I love th this conversation is um, we're inventing it. What, you know, what would it look like if the question was completely different? Of, of what would support people. Oh, that's, that's something they'd need. Well, and you start by asking the wrong question too, which I think is always very helpful. Um, the minute that you ask the wrong question and you suddenly start to look at it from the different perspective, um, then, you, then you realize, oh yes, this, this is fine. Because the, the question really is, all right, how, all of those hubs and the whole organization is going to need to know where to go and what they have to have when or if a, 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 an issue arises, whether it's a, a succession plan or in this case, a founder issue or something like that. Um, uh, and they, they arise, so we know that. So we, somebody needs to say, okay, they arise, what's gonna be the best possible outcome? Um, where, that sort of thing is going to have to happen in the hub. And that's going to be another one of those, one of these, one of these screen things. And that's what, that's what's so gorgeous about that is to think about what will be versus all the things we've been a part of before is to think about if something arises, 
people who are part of creating the future will be being catalytic thinking. Now, perhaps at different places in their learning and, you know, you know, some people may be bathing in it, new to it, yet they will, there will also be people in those conversations that someone comes forward and the first thing that's said is tell us more because that is the cultural norm of this movement is not a knee jerk reaction of something. And if someone does knee jerk reaction, react, they will be met with compassion and they will thank the other people for pulling them out of the weeds and, and saying, yes, Diane, please tell us more about what's going on because we are listening to you catalytically in support of you telling us about this situation. So that's the beauty of it is that it would be a very different way of being together when something may arise, yet it's not preparing for the worst. It's preparing to always be supportive of the people for whatever each day brings. I, I also feel like when Anne started bringing that up, this last um, topic up, is that, yes, the gr everyone involved in this will be doing their best to be catalytic thinkers in all respects. But, and to me, that's kind of like, I'm going to become a really great meditator. Like I'm going to try really hard. And sometimes I just, I'm not, I can't do it on some days. And so I feel like there's a, the systems or the information will be structured in such a way that people can make the leap because I feel like it's all about that, um, the continuum, right? So there will be the people that are steeped in it, like Rebecca said, or people from, I don't want to say from the outside, but the people who are asking those founder issue questions or in the way that they have always experienced them. And to take, uh, to have some, to know, so people can know where to go to say, I hear you. Uh, have a concern about A, let me show you how we address that. Uh, and people may then, the person who asked the original question, who has never experienced this before, may be like, oh, what? I don't want to tell you my winding path. I just want to know the answer. And so like, what are those different places along the way that we can have a map <laughs> or a, or a, FAQ or something that sort of bridges that gap to not only respond to the information they think they need, but respond in a way so that they feel heard and seen perhaps for the first time in their life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, I keep having this vision of the hubs being places for that and that the coordinators would have to be really well steeped in catalytic thinking so that the individuals don't have to be. Um, so that if you're new or you're, you're just not, I, I don't have time to take any classes, I don't have time to do anything, but I really love doing this piece here. Um, okay, when you come together, you're gonna absorb it by osmosis because every time you come together, you're gonna be asking those same questions. If, if somebody is in charge of making sure that catalytic thinking is the norm, um, then not everybody has to be. And, and it's, you know, we, we hold the space for each other. Other she, thoughts? You're thinking, I can smell the you know, oil burning. Can't you? Yeah, I know, she's got it in her face. I don't wanna know. <laughs> I'm just thinking that in so many ways, this is an inner journey, right? It's an inner journey for every person who's going to be involved. It's an inner journey for every one of those hubs, for the, you know, the organization, however it comes to be put together and all of that. And I think inner journeys are unpredictable. You know, there is a lot to be said to commitment, uh, to staying with it, to um, taking things as they come and riding with them, to accepting, uh, letting go, uh, becoming, you know, so there's so much to that. And in some ways, I feel 
the, the whole catalytic approach is um, a very spiritual approach in so many ways. And it could be because that's, you know, that's, that's my, uh, you know, frame of reference. But I think in any spiritual journey, what is needed is um, is the space to become. Mm. And so when I think of, uh, you know, the, the, the thing you just put on with the hubs and the central and all of that, I keep thinking that's, that feels to me like it's all over the place. What I would like to see it is in a space, a, a, a space where it's warmly holding it together. And so the organization becomes this space mm. as opposed to this center that people can come in and out out taking resources and all of that whereas we are allowing people to have that journey um, and also helping people with the, that tension between what's inside and what's outside and I think that's very important to really think about that tension because as you grow as you develop as you become you feel that tension in so many ways and at so many times and if the organization, whatever, again, whatever it's going to be, can, can help to, um, in some ways, alleviate some of the pain of that tension for those who are inside growing and becoming, I think we're doing, doing a great job. I love it. Lovely. 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 Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because there are people who will, um, again, depending on which activity they want to be part of, there's people who are going to come from a personal journey place and there's people going to come from a very pragmatic, my organization needs X place. Um, you know, we're, we're currently partnering with a, a government department who um, is, is looking at our, our department needs to accomplish X. They're looking from a very practical standpoint outcomes. <laughs> outcomes you bet your buns outcomes there's a federal grant behind it it better have evidence <laughs> um and so it's 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 interesting that people will come from from different places depending on what the activity is uh depending on 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 where they're and and if the whole entity is about holding the space for that and creating the conditions for that from from a place of Catalytic thinking, which is a place of compassion and wisdom and love. Um, you know, if, if we're going to, uh, you know, and, and I know you always delight in the fact that this is an experiment. We'll find out. We never did it. Nobody ever did it. We'll find out. And, and we'll adjust and we'll, we'll share what we're learning along the way. Which is, is, is But I'm fascinated, Shiva, because I think you, I think you are absolutely right. Uh, it, is an in, it, it is a journey. I mean, uh, the way that those hubs out the outside of the big collective enoughness hub, the way that those hubs uh, formed is that there are certain activities. There, there are consultant fellows. There are educational programs. There are many. Th there are what I think. Uh, what I think Rebecca calls skunk works, uh, which is sort of a big experimental stew pot where we go and play, and. Um, and each of those is independent and of itself, but they're all connected to that central place. But when you talk about a, holding a place and a place that is warm, I almost think of a large, big, round building that you're, that you're talking, you're, I'm hearing, and a space that's actually a visible space rather than I'm holding the space for you to be a little bit more careful in, in how you asked your questions. Um, so uh, is that what I'm hearing? It, uh... no, it, it's interesting. I wasn't actually thinking about a space, but it's interesting that when you say that, I do think that there is value to, for, hu for humans. There is value. You know, when, Hildy, when you and I go and meet with our spiritual guru, we go to a space. Right, and that space is is um, sanctified, and that space is where we feel safe, 
and where we feel we're understood and we are um, welcome and, 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 it, and on and on and on, right? So having a space in itself, a, an actual brick and mortar kind of space, I think in some ways does have value. But before we even get to that, there is this, this, this uh, emotional space where you can cultivate this trust and empathy and understanding that needs to be between all the participants, right? Sort of what you do here on a Zoom platform. Uh, but, but if then we are talking about hundreds of people, you know, how do you, how do you hold that space of trust and mutual understanding and all of that for hundreds of people? That, you know, and, and I'm not saying that it's not doable. It's absolutely doable. But I think that's when we are thinking about this, this blossoming of, of this movement, then we really have to think about what are people going to need individually as groups and how do we bring that the, the safety that they need, the, the embracing that they need, the uh, empathy, the understanding, because that, that is not, to me, you can call it a resource, but it's not a computer resource. It is not a, you know, it, it's a completely different, um, it, it addresses totally different needs in human beings. Well, it's, it's why... Again, um, two things. Um, one, it's why the intention is that hubs will be places where people find not only resources, but each other, mm -hmm. guided by catalytic thinking. And that they become places. And whether it's physical places or online places, uh, they become places where um, people find, yeah, resources, because everybody needs stuff. Whatever the stuff is, they need stuff. But more importantly, they need each other. And um, traditionally, again, looking at how organizations are structured, they come together in a staff meeting, not because they need each other, but because I need to tell you and you need to report in. And so, so if that, that intention, I think what, what you're really talking about is, is building with intention. And, and that the intention be that, uh, that we're bringing out the best in each other every time we encounter each other. Um, and that no matter if it is a small localized hub of people who are just doing the same stuff um, or, or a hub that is a lot of coordinators, that, that, that you walk into that room, whether it's an online room or a physical room, and you feel that. And, and that is because it's a place of connection. And whether it's a connection because I need stuff or because I need a hug, um, it's, I, I think there's something really powerful in that. The other thing that, that I'm reveling in is that um, we're intending to do the legal part by July 1. And then we're intending to spend the next nine and a half years figuring out what the hell this looks like. And adjusting it as it goes and saying, is this, you know, it, 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 it was birthed of catalytic decision making. It was birthed of catalytic thinking. So it, we know that it wasn't an idea of, hey, I heard about this thing. We could do that. Um, it really came from creating the conditions that that will allow people to be at their best. And um, and we'll tweak at it and tweak at it. And, you know, the the. The, the mantra that you guys have all heard that if you're constantly, if your goal is to learn, then you don't have to embrace failure because you're not failing, you're learning. And, and our whole job is to be an experiment um, that, you know, it is, it is just as important that we, you know, they're, they're, our mission is, is actualized in two ways. One, we help other people experiment um, bring this into change their own systems. So we teach and we share and we bring together people so that they can change their own systems. And we internally act as an, an experiment in systems change ourselves. Um, and there's just delicious joy in saying, I don't know. It's back to the work of the Bodhisattva. <laughs> well, 
and I'm, of course, with my background, I think of an AA meeting, which is a physical experience of, of feeling that relief roll off of you. It is completely safe and absolutely, and you can, uh, you can walk into one of those meetings anywhere in the world and you will be safe and you will be, uh, you will be embraced. Exactly. Be about, mm -hmm. uh, bottling that, chem that, that component is something that would really be nice to be able to do and just hand it out to anybody who's taken an immersion. Don't you think? Yes. Don't, you think? <laughs> yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yep. So, so the, the big answer, the, the reason for, for going into the detail on what we're looking at and what we're building, um, some of what Creating the Future will be doing, and you guys got the, the strategic objectives for the year, some of what Creating the Future is going to be doing over the next several years, um, and, and Rebecca and I hold up and came up with all of that stuff over three, four days in Boise. Um, and it all came out of what has been happening over the past two years. So we didn't, you know, again, it wasn't idea driven. It really came out of, okay, what's been going on? Where is everything going? Um, there's a lot of programmatic stuff that we already have um, that has uh, no infrastructure, no systems. Um, it's it's been been built because it needed to be built because it was a good thing to do and people needed it. Um, and so putting some uh, solid ground under those things, um, those will each be activities. They'll be out in, in, in those bubbles, they'll be uh, activities. Um, so I was sharing it to show you what the structure would look like. The, the, the very, very nitty gritty on the ground is that um, we've got stuff that needs solidity under it. Um, and so looking at, at um, both simultaneously, and the thing that's been, been fun to think about is um, talking to potential partners about all of what we're doing, obviously identifying what they're interested in. You know, they're not going to talk about this if they're not interested in that. Um, to see if they want to play in that realm. Um, Is, is very, very different than saying we need to go out and get a $3 million grant to build an organization. Um, that there may be people who want to learn about effective ways of bringing people together in community and online communities um, because they do a lot of online communities and they're hit or miss. Okay, let's play. We want to expand on the two that we've got. Let's play together and we can bring our knowledge into what you're doing. And you could, there's, there's just so many ways that we could interplay based on all the different things that we're doing. But again, only if we're doing it together. Um, when you guys looked at the stuff that Rebecca sent out, um, what stood out to you? What, what was exciting? What was what jumped out? Anne, you're on mute. What always jumps out for me, Rebecca, is how well you take what you know a, a four-hour conversation and get it down to two pages. <laughs> Hey, Hildy. Hildy right. is. <laughs> this one, all right. <laughs> Either one. Um, but especially the finding partners. I mean, that was those were the questions we had is who the hell are we looking for? And what do, what are the criteria we've got to figure out about? And I think this is very, very helpful indeed. So uh, Uh, what jumped out to me was this whole thing on where people are in their continuum of potential and how we're going to reach them and how we're going to interact with them and engage them. Um, I, you know, just, just so much work and thinking and creating has gone into putting this together. And I was just, I, th I thought that was fantastic because it really... You know, a lot of times 
we say to ourselves, I'll go to this meeting and do what I have to do, right? But this is really about, I'm going to meet people where they are and I'm going to understand them where they are and I'm going to reach them in a way that they can be receptive to uh, because I, I understand where they are. And at each stage, I'm going to meet them there. So I thought that was, uh, yeah, kudos to all of you who have worked on that and put that together. I was very impressed by that. It, it's been interesting that one of the things that we've been um, playing with, um, we've known that um, we were going to, as, as an ed, uh, the education part of our mission was always going to be along the continuum making sure that we have programs that meet people where they are with what they think they need um, and then opening the door to what's possible. And what, um, again, it's in, in looking for people who want to partner um, in, in some of that or all of that is the understanding of bringing that into um, the, the typical management support kinds of organizations, a nonprofit resource center, a, uh, a chamber of commerce that does X number of classes on this um, and uh, a, a statewide association of that, that they do education programs, but they, it's again, not aimed at the people it's aimed at the program. So we do workshops. And so how effective are those workshops when they, when they measure effectiveness? They say, well, some, you know, some do the stuff and some don't do the stuff. And, and that's just the way it is. Well, it's just the way it is when you start to realize you're aiming a thing at only a certain population that is, is able to accept it right now, but you're saying it's for everybody. So the people that it would have targeted on the continuum are the ones that are going to go right to doing it and it's going to be great, but you're not going to get. So um, again, in terms of, of who will this stuff resonate with um, it's, it's occurring that there are people who do, um, who do capacity building. And um, it's always, it's, it's generally a one size fits all capacity building. You get a consultant or you get a workshop. Um, and okay, so what would it look like if, it, it also, Shiva, is a really interesting way for those kinds of organizations to build a business model. Mm. Because part of uh, the, the continuum of potential is that at some of the earlier stages, um, you're not willing to pay anything. Mm. I'll read a blog post. Only if it's not too long. And only if it's got like three tips that will get you. Um, and, and a little bit further down, if you're at the, the I'll try something new, uh, you might buy a book. You might uh, take a workshop. Um, and if you're at the diving in place, um, you might go from I spent $29.95 for this book. The book changed my life. I'm going to plunk down $5,000 and take a year out of my life and do X. And, and, and it's, it's that tipping point. It's why we're, we're, we focused so much on the I'll try something because that's really the tipping point to I, I want to be this. And the, the, you know, the interesting thing about it, again, is from a, from a perspective of somebody who works in the capacity building industry that might want to partner with us is it's also a way of building a business model. If you look at, uh, at it, at the value of saying somebody who um, is looking for just tips and tools, um, why are we discounting them by saying, well, we're not going to do that because it's free and there's no, no, these are, that, that's your job is to make sure they they know what they're doing. Um, but it doesn't bring in any money. So we're not going to do so again, it's understanding that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think uh, the focus being on the, you know, diving in immersion, you know, kind of like that really deep dive in all of the work for years of Hildy. And then what's happened in this recent years with faculty coming on board and more people is that, what we have is beyond a rich, the richest mind in the world for us to then be teasing out other content and the learnings that we've had from developing and teaching immersion to then talk about an endless series of videos that I, I've even imagined like, like um, improv because you could hit us with it. Give me a situation. Okay, 
I'm going to go down idea different driven strategy on the board right now. And now I'm going to go causality driven and like an endless series of little video clips. It does not matter what topic is brought forward from the world to continue to show that this shit is you know, works and it works everywhere is, is like also being playful with it. Cause it does not matter your topic that you fling at, whoever, you know, someone well-versed in catalytic thinking, give us a whiteboard and we'll lock it down both ways. It's, and, and it becomes really exciting when you think about it. Like I, I imagine like gatherings with people over beers where it'd be like, tell me, what do you got? What do you got? Like, just like charades, but way more powerful. So, like, <laughs> a board game. A board game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Board game. Drunk history. <laughs> yeah. Drunk, I'm telling you, yeah. <laughs> everything comes back to drunk <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Laura, any other thoughts? Anne, Shiva? Um, what's next? What's next? Um, given that we're pretty solid at this point about what we what we need to accomplish and the approach that we want to take. Um, the <coughs> Uh, the next step is really about getting to know people, um, finding out who is out there that is asking the same kinds of questions about either big or little of, of what we're asking, um, and, uh, and finding where those points of confluence are so that we can have those conversations. And again, um, making sure that we're having conversations with people who can create ripples. Um, because we got only 10 years and everything we do needs to be immensely strategic and leveraged. And, and for us, that's always about sleuthing. And um, for those who are not familiar with the term, um, it is um, really just getting to know people and learning as much as you can about the thing that you're talking about and doing it together. Um, the, the benefits are building relationship um, and building knowledge. And uh, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, the Japanese concept of nemawashi. Um, it, is, uh, it was made really, really popular in the heyday of, of the rise of Toyota and the rise of Japanese industry in the, in the 80s when uh, when when Japanese business was all the rage, um, and uh, but but it is it is a concept that is um, if you get an idea in in Western society, if you get an idea, and it's it's not just business, but we've we've inherited that one as well as as the community benefit sector. Um, you get an idea, uh, you seal yourself off with that idea because if you tell somebody, they're going to steal it. Uh, you do all the research that you can. You ask uh, questions that will get you what you need, but you're smart enough. You can figure it out. And you pull it all together, and you create a plan. You budget that plan. You find somebody under a lot of non-disclosure agreements that will fund that plan, and then you do that plan. And you may uh, have a focus group to see what other people think about that plan, but mostly you don't really want to know what they think. You want them to say, this is great. Um, or you'll make some minor adjustments, <laughs> but it's at the end of the of the you put it all together already. Um, I, you know, I always liken it to when the city spends five million dollars on engineering a road and then has a public hearing. Um, they're not going to throw away the five million dollars of engineering because they don't give a shit what you think. They just legally have to have a public hearing. So that it's at the end that we ask. What Nemawashi does is it turns it entirely on its head. And what it says is when you get an idea, your first thing is to talk to a lot of people. I have this idea. What do you think? Um, what's your experience been with this kind of thing? Um, have you seen this before? Does this sound reasonable? Is this even a problem that I'm trying to solve that isn't even a problem? Is this an issue? Do you want that same thing? Do you like that same thing? Do you know anybody else who is doing this kind of thing? And uh, traditionally, when it is done, it is that when you finally, in, in the Japanese business environment, when you finally raise your hand in the group and say, I have an idea, 
everyone in that room already knows that idea because you have shared it with everybody already. You've gotten all their opinions. You've worked the bugs out together and it's done. So you don't then need to have the focus group. And so that's really what sleuthing is all about is um, the, the most effective way we have found, uh, Dimitri and I, and this is our fourth startup, um, the, the most effective way we have found to, to pull together uh, people who care about something is to, to go through that process. And, to, and, and we call it sleuthing because it's really just asking a lot of questions. Um, you know, you, you've got that, that famous Columbo line at the end, ma'am, I got just one more question. Um, <laughs> did you really kill your husband? Um, <laughs> um, but, but that's really what it is, is it's just, it's just sitting down with people and, um, we built two diaper banks rooted entirely in sleuthing. Um, and when we built the second one in Phoenix, we had a um, we had funding to do exploration to see if it um, to see if it made sense to try and 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 replicate it. We had um, a, a funder who loved us who wanted to invest in that, and it gave us the freedom to walk into every funder in town to say we know that you know what's going in, in on in town better than anybody because every organization has to do their needs assessments and tell you, is there a need for this? So if we want to know, is there a need for a diaper bank? You're going to tell us because you're getting all of that from everybody that is applying for your grants. And we don't want your money because we're okay right now. We don't want your money. We want your information. And there was just a beautiful sense of relief on the part of all of these foundations to share what they knew, to share who they were, to, to advise us, to tell us, you know who you need to talk to is this one. And you know who's doing this? It's really interesting. They're doing really cool stuff. Because we started the conversation by saying, we're not here for money. Um, and we had several funders who said, when you are ready to ask for money, you will come back and see us, won't you? Okay. Um, one of us, one of them turned into a seventy-five thousand dollars startup grant for the Phoenix Diaper Bank um, because we had so many conversations prior that we're like, no, we, we're not ready. We don't want money. Um, we want, we want to talk. And so that's really what we're looking at here is really just engaging people to find out, um, to to find out information, and to start making the connections with people who really care about the stuff we care about. And, and, you know, if half the conversations we have, if a third, if a, an eighth of the conversations we have lead us to the people who are like, I've been studying this for 10 years. I am so excited about this. Um, you're a laboratory and we can do it. Um, so uh, what we need to do, and I want to be um, mindful of our time and, and, um, and maybe start fresh next time. Um, what we really need to do is create a sleuthing plan, which will be things like, um, who do we want to talk to? Uh, what do we want to ask them? Uh, how will we find who they are? So, um, what you thinking, Anne? I can see you're thinking. I'm thinking that I have a new client in Tracy and that's awful close to over the hill to Lafayette. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Sit in the garden. <laughs> See the, sit in the garden. <laughs> so I'm thinking that that might that that might be something that that once we've we've met next time and kind of laid and tested that that then even I might be able to spend some time on just digging around and pulling up those people with influence and stuff so i have and a couple I've, I've actually started it by doing that that review of the first of the 25 wealthiest uh, american foundation and really ruling out the ones that were totally nothing and um and then i want to take the next thing i wanted to take was the, um, the podcast list and uh and then I just want to brain dump with a whole lot of people on who's an influence thinker. Uh, 
you know, it, uh, who's a thinking influencer or stuff, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. So. What's popping for you, Shiva? I'm just, I have, I have a lot of questions as to sort of, I understand that we need to come up with the questions we need to ask and who and how do we go about finding them. Do we have a sense of the scale we want this to start out? In other words, of the, well, like Anne just talked about the 25 big funders. So to me, that's like a huge scale, right? I so told you I'm, grandiosity was my birth name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering, if, do, do we have a sense of the scale? Do we want to say, you know, we're going to come up with these questions and we're going to find a few people, but this is an experiment after all. So we're going to start with in a smaller scale, ask those questions, see what, see what we hear. Um, and from those learn and slowly take it out to bigger and bigger. So do we go with people who have smaller frame of influence versus a really large frame of influence? I mean, you know, and, and I don't know, you know, again, people being in different, Mm -hmm. you know, place in that potential, um, do we look for people who are in a, almost a tipping point of the potential on their own? In other words, the work that they've been doing shows to us that they are in some ways, not necessarily the creating the future approach, but they are in some ways also looking, hiring that vastness of the city, right? Do we go looking you frozen for that they you, might. Yeah. You're, 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 you're freezing up a little bit. <clears throat> um, those, those are the kinds of questions that we will absolutely be asking. Um, yeah. The, the, um, I love matrixing more than I love anything. Um, <laughs> and I love lots of things. So um, yeah, it's, it is, it is basically what you are talking about very specifically. Every single question you asked is a cri is a decision making criteria. And so once we have uh, come up with, um, it could be types of people that we want to explore. People who are interested in capacity building. People who are interested in blowing up philanthropy and starting over again. People who are, and, and again, it changes when we stop thinking about um, groups and start thinking about individuals. Right. Um, because you can't have a conversation with a group. You can't have a conversation with a foundation. You can have a conversation with Joe. And so if we start thinking about, okay, um, this is a group where a lot of people are having the conversation and Mary happens to be the one that's really been out there about this conversation about X. Um, okay. Uh, and, and so by the time we come up with, you know, people who are doing, who are researching this, people who are investigating that, people who are very vocal about this, and then coming up with all the criteria you listed and a whole bunch of others and weighting them and saying, oh, okay, here's, here's where it makes the most sense. Some of the other things that we'll also be looking at is um, uh, people we already know. Who do we already know? Um, who, you know, and, and we've, we've frequently gone with a, um, a different kind of matrix that weights just the people we already know that sort of kind of seem like they might fit in um, against like two criteria. One, um, do they love us and would tie themselves to railroad tracks for us? Um, two, can they um, either make a decision or are they in a position where, where this conversation is going to be really, really valuable? Um, and you know, frequently you don't know. Um, but, but in, in the olden days when we were, you know, doing consulting, it was frequently, can they make a decision? Um, if, if they are a, uh, I happen to know somebody who is at an, an entry level, just started working at the Kellogg foundation. And I, I mentioned Kellogg because Kellogg is so big in capacity building. Um, if, if the question is, well, my niece just got a job and it's her first job out of college, we could talk to her. Um, the, the, can she be of help is probably not as going to be as she's not going to get a three. She's going to get a one. Um, and so, you know, just it, again, it, f figuring that stuff out, that's kind of like decision-making. <laughs> I should say to 
think, Shiva, that when, I, when I've been looking at those foundations, I've been looking at the staff lists and the biographies of the staff members so that, um, uh, and we have some of these criteria were part of a discussion I was part of. So what I did was to take that and start just playing. I haven't done anything that is solid because we weren't there yet, but I just started sort of figuring out what, what would be fun. And, and, and I mean, there are, the lists are endless. I mean, there are also the people we want to know about us. And that's the other thing. If the secretary can't help you, she might be able to get, get us an appointment with her boss and her boss may not be the big panjandrum, but we may decide that that foundation is sufficiently important that we would like to have someone in it know about creative, uh, about catalytic thinking. And mm -hmm. so we will have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And we will get their ideas because sometimes the lesser panjandrum has really good ideas. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Very true. Well said. Yeah, it's 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 um, it's it's really just that's going to be our work over the next several meetings is figuring all of that out, and we will practice together. And um, just as you have experienced, all three of you have experienced um, that that we'd never teach on our own. Um, cause one of us did that for a really long time and never wants to do it again. Um, <laughs> um, we won't go, you know, we won't go sleuthing on our own. We, we will have always, there'll always be two of us. Um, and you know, we, we, we want to make sure that we create the conditions for success for us. Um, but yeah, those, those are. Um, you guys both, Anne and Shiva, are hitting the exact questions that it's going to be fun to, that's, that's why we need a plan. <laughs> that's why we need a plan. So, um, how, how does all of this feel to you guys as we're, um, as, as we're sort of winding into getting ready for scheduling another, another time together, um, looking, looking over any notes that you took, um, things that you're thinking about, things that popped for you, ahas, just taking a deep breath. Um, and what is, what is standing out to you? What's, what is alive for you as we're coming to a close here? You know, what um, came to my mind was this is really the kind of work that never sunsets. And so while we can say this would be a 10 year experiment to, you know, the, 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 the thing about movements that you never know the ripple that you create. And even when you stop, the ripple continues. So this will be the kind of work that uh, truly will never stop. Pretty awesome. I think what struck me in my notes the most is, is Shiva, your, com your com comment that this is an inner journey, that, um, that it's it's one of those things that it's it's wonderful to be constantly reminded of or reminded of from time to time, because it, every time I see somebody who's just started catalytic thinking, st studying catalytic thinking, I meet somebody who is greatly confused, and I remember how I felt, <laughs> and. Uh, and I just want to take them and hug them and say, it's all right. It's inside out and you're not wrong. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but, and I suspect that that's um, an impulse that we all feel. And probably it's one that we should all remember regularly that, that it is, it is, 
uh, we're dealing with you, you're fragile now, we understand that. And, uh, and it's okay. <laughs> it's practice, not a perfect. Mm -hmm. And it is inside out, you're absolutely right, but that's fine. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> I think that this is, um, well, I do have a clarifying question about our next, the next meeting. Is that a meeting at which we will lay out a bazillion questions we want to, to use to determine how and when and who, or is there work to be done between now and that meeting? Um, I think there's just a little bit of setup work in terms of what the questions will be that will guide us next time. But I think we're, we're if anybody has, if, if, let, bleh. looking at the documents that you got, if any ideas spark for you of the kinds of people you think might be interested in playing or that you'd love to talk to about this, let's start gathering that just, but it's not like, I don't think we need it as, as, as an assignment. What do you think, Rebecca? Um, no, I think, I think we're, what you said is the next, is the next step. Like, I don't think there's any holding back. Like if you already have, you know, I just think about the contributions of having uh, Shiva and Laura join and be a part of all of this. So from all the wisdom and experiences you have, there's not like, if come to the next meeting and say and share with us at that moment, it's not like, wait till we get there. Like if you're already thinking about individuals in the world, share them, <laughs> you know, like don't, don't hold back because we'd like to learn about it. And I think it's also encouraging to us to hear, Oh, there are, you know, there are other people out there and we know they are, but to actually have a name of Tom in Iowa or wherever he is w would be exciting for all of us to hear. So I think um, that's kind of like, free you know sharing as we and into our system database vessel maven laura yes some way that we organize the people you know we we've created little you know word docs where we've dumped people's names in yet knowing we've got um some lots of brains coming into the mix to be for us to think about how do we share stuff so we we organize out of the gate the good news is we don't have tons of disorganization that now needs to be organized so, you know, we can build, you know, the vessel for putting the stuff in there. And um, no, the one, th I'm sorry. Oh, finish, please. no, no. If you're, if you're speaking on, I'll, I can wait. I've got, I was I've ask Laura, uh, what would, what would be, what convert part, what part of this conversation would you see? helping you the most in the, in the contributions that you're trying to make? I think it's, um, well, for one, the, as far as answering Hildy's question of what popped for me, um, it was excitement to use these conversations with potential partners as um, ways to excite them ways to um, remind them that that there's there are other ways of being that are more that are maybe different than what they are currently experience so it's almost like not proselytizing but like you know, I can imagine there's all these different uh, levels of people the the, the people uh, they're along that different the different parts of the continuum um, and how fun it will be to see if it like, Ooh, where do we think they are? And then after the conversation think, Ooh, were we right? Where, Oh no, they're really over here. Or, oh, Oh, that person said they were here, but really they're over here. And, and um, just that creating those relationships out of, you know, by you doing this process, um, really exciting to me, regardless of if, of how it ends up like that's the beauty of it it's all good and um and then as far as just capturing information i th i think that's what i will be more focused on in these next meetings is hearing people ask the questions and then thinking about ways to store 
the answers to those questions. Um, Cause there, I could see so many different lists or, or spreadsheets, like what kind of questions do you ask such a person? What, you know, what if they, you know, like you said, the, the matrix piece of it is, so I'm going to, that will also take catalytic thinking to even come up with the systems to store it all. So it, it gets, it gets really meta, you know, really <laughs> meta really fast. And then I think, oh no, I'm crashing up against my own continuum here. <laughs> but, I don't know. It all, it sounds really fun. Whatever. I just hit every stage all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Running through those tissue paper walls. <laughs> so it's all going to turn out great. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah. It, 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 sometimes the interesting thing for me is it, it, it's um, It, it's it's the graphic that we show during immersion that is the then and now, which is the, you know, if we take our time up front and ask the questions and figure all, um, it's it's going to happen fast and smooth and joyfully. And um, and because, you know, in, in repeating uh, Rebecca's beautiful words the other day, when you're starting something, there are no systems in place. Um, we're going to be making it up as we go along. Um, and not that we haven't done this before, not that we don't know the questions to ask, and not that we don't have the framework, but there's going to be many places over the next couple of weeks as we're meeting that we're going to go, oh, that, you know what, we could have asked that like six steps back. Okay, let's see. What... That's cool. Yeah. One thing that when I was reading through the material that Rebecca shared before and hearing today, the, the same question keeps popping into my mind, which is um, like, so in, in, in the conversations we've had recently about who are our potential fellows, who are our potential um, participants, who are the potential, um, for lack of a better word, funders uh, or partners. It's like, well, how do you, how do you ask the right, what's the right question to to get someone to to get to make their eyes light up and say, "Ooh, ooh, that's me," and and to and how do we ensure that we don't cross someone off the list simply because we haven't asked them the right question yet? So that can't be sure that we haven't or won't. Or or reframing that, what does it take to include everybody on the list in some way? Because mm -hmm. they might not identify with any of the words we've used, but and something when you're sitting across from them, they will identify with something else that we may not even be articulating, and then they might get excited. Yeah, there are going to be some winding paths too, so uh, which will help us guide those questions. Yeah. Oh yeah. So. And, and I also think that uh, it's it's very, I hate to use the word marketing, but it's very much like that, right? So in that, once we know who is sitting across the table from us, the questions almost have to be the kind of questions that would resonate with them, right? So it's just knowing we, we need to do our best to know that person in as many ways as we possibly can. There's, 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 there's a couple things that we'll, we'll be talking about this a lot. Um, there's a yes and an and. Mm -hmm. And the yes is you never know anybody until you sit down and you ask them who they are. Um, and I can't tell you the number of times, I've stopped. I'll tell you honestly, when somebody calls and they wanna have a conversation, I rarely do any homework on them. I want to hear them tell me I don't want to look at their website. And um, that is because I don't want, I don't want to prejudge. I don't want to, because I'm going to start telling my own story to me before I'm in the room with them. And I don't know. And so, so often, you know, if we're going to be following catalytic thinking, we are going to be listening and framing questions so that we can listen. 
and learn and that's it. And so the questions may wind up being spending two minutes talking about what we're thinking about doing and saying, have you heard of anything like this? And then just shutting up. That could easily be it. And it could be, we have six questions, but chances are we'll have three. And probably the first one is gonna be, so talk to me about you. And all of us know that that is the best way to raise funds. Um, it, is, it is major gift fundraising 101 and planned giving. And it's, it's, um, it's, it happens, but this is a whole different thing. And because it is people focused, I mean, we really have to, 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 to maintain that recognition that we are there to look at a person and see if that person wants to play with us, wants to play with us, not we want you to play with us. Do you want to play with us? And um, yep. tell you, yeah. what will it do for you? I like that. I like that. Rebecca, I, thank you. Oh, Laura, you can go. I'll go next. So I uh, kind of the along those lines of that question that keeps popping up in my mind about how do we um, talk to all the potential people um, is how do we and maybe this is what our next meeting is for, how do we create the conditions for our success so that, because it, it, when I think about it, it can be very overwhelming to think, well, everyone on the planet is a potential participant, duh. Yeah. Like that's exhausting, you know, to think, oh my God, I have to talk to every person on the planet. Um, so what are the, what's the filters we can create that help us um, kind of the, maybe, what Anne has already experienced in, in trying to put together some kind of a list as well. What questions did you ask yourself to even get them on or off the list? So we have some kind of um, filter that, or some kind of, maybe we have a list of questions we ask before we decide who to even approach because our time being one of the greatest resources we have, um, how do we best leverage that? to um, to get into practice mode with the most uh, the biggest effect from the get-go it also changes and and I'm going to be mindful that every time we're asking how we want to ask what would it take instead of how um, but it changes when we change the question from okay if there's um, seven billion people on the planet who are we actually gonna talk to um, and who's on the list versus who's off the list, that is a really different question than uh, who are the people we really want to talk to in what order? Because if this is a matter of in what order, we may say the first 10 we absolutely want to talk to are these 10. And we'll see what comes out of that and move from there. And the other 90 on the list may wind up and, we, and the next question might be, okay, so in what ways do we want to engage those other 90? Because we have just learned everything. Because what also happens is from those first 10, they're going to say, you know who you need to talk to? And now you're on a completely different trail uh, because, and that's the joy, that's, the, that's the, the bestest fun in the world is when they say, ooh, 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 yeah. Um, okay, so then the question becomes, okay, what do we want to do? to connect with those other 90, um, where it's not looking like it's exactly what we need to talk about right now, but we don't want to lose them. They're different. It, it just becomes different questions, but it's, it's definitely in what order. Once you start identifying, these are the people we really want to talk to. And, and very much to the point you made, Anne, of not just about even if they want to play, but in some cases, do, would it be helpful for them to know about catalytic thinking? Right, yeah. And Okay, so that opens a whole different yeah. conversation there was, leads there was, to Shiva saying this is endless work yay yeah. <laughs> you know I mean in the in the can you imagine just spending 10 years engaging people in these conversations okay I'm good <laughs> yeah some of the questions I asked uh, myself Laura were um, does this person have passion or does this foundation uh, support um, social change uh, do they are they interested and then as I get into some of the people uh, the bios were different sometimes they would talk about the person who really was there you know the 
he has a dog and he plays tennis on the weekends and things like that. And I found this man, I told, I told Rebecca and, and, uh, and Hildy about, he's at the um, uh, Ford Foundation. And the reason I zeroed in on this man, who is a major program director there, was because he did a whole study of humor and social change. And I thought, okay, stand up comic here coming through here. This is my man. <laughs> so. I also would say that we need to sort of keep in mind that uh, a big part of this is learning why people will not want to participate. Right. As, as we go asking those questions, as we engage people, we're going to hear a lot about the reasons why I can't do it. I don't want to do it. Um, it's not the right time. It's not the right place. It's not. And, and we can learn from all of that. You know, in, in major fundraising and, you know, when we go to big donors, you always have to consider that there is going to be one out of 10 that's going to say yes to you. And then the other nine are work in progress. Right. So, uh, and, and, and we could come back to the continuum potential of all of that. But as we are asking those questions, the questions that we ask and how we get to engage with them are also going to help us to get better at these engagements, you know, to get in some ways to get smarter in, in maybe being able to read the situation better, maybe being able to feel it better, maybe being, so all of that, I think, you know, uh, all of it is good. None of it is not good, right? Even if we don't, if, even if we can't engage people, we're still learning, it's an experiment. We're still learning, we're still growing, we're still understanding and we're moving forward. Awesome. Really awesome, really awesome. Any, any other thoughts that are popping for you guys? Rebecca, have you done yours? Well, yeah, no, I haven't. Um, well, there was just, I just was thinking to the point in my time of my life where I did go on like um, a blind date or something, you know, so I always looked at it as I'm going out into a different environment. I'm connecting with another person. It will be interesting. And I, I think we will be doing more work behind it, but we're going to learn. We're going to connect with another human. That is time well spent. So I'm good with that. And you know, we'll have a whole strategy behind it. Yet if we just, if we note that we are connecting with another human and bringing out their best for however long we have that time with them. And we're going to learn a shit ton in every conversation. Um, the other thing I was thinking about is we often, you know, when we often are feeling scarcity, the, the answer is there aren't enough people engaged. And um, while I wasn't feeling scarcity about this conversation or project, I'm noting how rich in, in the human sense of richness I feel by the five of us being in the room. You know, last week, Laura stepped into creating the future more deeply and showed up at the ops team meeting knowing, you know, come to the meeting, something will emerge, something huge emerged. And then she's also here today and Shiva, we've been you know, dancing for when is Shiva going to be in the house? And, and, and with each human being, we get that huge jolt of the energy of the other people. And, and I think about how often people are in systems where they can't ask for support. They can't ask for other humans because they live in a system where it's, you're smart, you'll figure it out. Oh, just let me know if you need any help, which they don't do. So even us demonstrating the openness to we want help. We want wisdom. We don't have all the answers. We haven't baked our little idea in a silo and we're serving it up for you to fund is, is awesome. The fact that this meeting will be watched by, we don't even know who might see this meeting and say, hey, I'd like to have a conversation with you and you don't even know who I am. We say, yay. <laughs> so, Hildy, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> The, th the thing that is striking me, um, and, and it really is so directly related to what you just said, Rebecca, is um, most recently, uh, Laura, you came to us from, from somebody connecting you, um, but Shiva, eventually, it made sense for us to have a conversation. And it wasn't about anything. It was about getting to know each other, finding out what was interesting to each other. It wasn't, oh, Shiva contacted me. Maybe she'll take a class or maybe she'll donate or maybe she'll, no, it was just, 
let's get to know each other. And um, when, when Laura said, I, I want to get more involved in creating the future, um, it wasn't, well, here's our list of seven things that we need done. Uh, which do you want to do? It was, I don't know, nothing's making real good sense to me right now. How about you? Nah, why don't you just come to the ops team meeting and see what emerges? The, the, the willingness to be really, really present with each other. And that is always our first response. When somebody says, I'm interested in, in finding out more about creating the future, or I'd like to help, or I'd like to take a class, or what do you guys do? Uh, it's always, let's just have a conversation. And uh, talk to me about you. Tell me about what you do. Tell me about what you love. Tell me about, and, and I don't see this as being any different. Um, it's just different people. And, um, and what we're looking for eventually is, is um, a relationship that clicks and what comes out of that relationship. And we have no idea what's going to come out of it. And it's going to be awesome. So, so it's, it's just, it, it suddenly, when you were talking, Rebecca, it just occurred to me that this is no different than any other conversation we have with anybody. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've, I have had uh, three in the past week uh, conversations. Um, I'll just tell you about one very, very quickly, but they've all been with people in our consultants community. And um, they have been people who have, whether through the community itself or privately to me, um, showed up with a problem. And uh, one I spoke with last week um, had an issue that uh, they didn't feel comfortable sharing with the group. It was very, very sensitive with a client that they were working with. Would I walk, talk them through stuff? And they kept coming up and I said, well, just talk. Just talk to me. And they just talked. And uh, eventually um, it made sense what they could do, how they could. And, and, and this person said, I, I don't know how to pay you. I was like, yeah, no, don't. Um, if you feel moved to do so, make a donation to creating the future. Uh, but again, coming from that, that I'm not going to say, oh, good, this is somebody from the community and they want to pay us. And what am I going to do? And how am I going to coach them for an hour? I'm going to, it's like, yeah, let's just, you know, let's, let's just be real with each other. And, um, and it works out and, and I'll, I'll share one final story. And then, um, and then I have one more observation that occurred to me, uh, years ago. When we were first starting out, we didn't have a board. We didn't have anything. Um, we did a, an open letter. Dimitri and I had decided to um, give up our consulting practice. It was the end of 2010. And we had been trying to form this thing at the same time as keeping consulting, and we couldn't do both. And we said, all right, we'll jump in the deep end with no floaties and see what happens. We don't know how it's going to go. But, you know, how are you going to support yourself? I don't know. Um, and we dove in. And so it's the end of the year. And that's when everybody does their, their year-end campaigns. And we had made the vow early on that we would do everything publicly. We would, do, we would make every, and this was before you could even do Google Hangouts. This was, you, you did it on a blog. And so um, we said, well, this isn't a decision for us to make. Let's make it publicly. And so we said, is there a good reason not to do a year-end campaign? And all the fundraisers went into, there's never a bad time to ask for money. Any opportunity you've got, ask for money. You need to ask for money, ask for money, ask for money, ask for money. And one, two voices actually, two voices said, is this what we want to be about? Is this, is this what, you know, you've been talking for a long time about changing this whole paradigm. Is this what you want to be about? Those two became our first board members. And... It wasn't because I went out and said, I'm looking for board members. It was because that was engaging a completely different conversation. One of them was so impressed that we made the decision uh, not to do the annual campaign that uh, they donated $5,000 at the end of the year. I, these were two people I knew from social media. These are not anybody I knew because it's like, oh, I'm going to engage those people because they've got money. And it was, it was completely because we had a human conversation about the things that matter to people. So, um, you know, it's just amazing. People want to share of themselves in a million ways. I had a, a random thought as we were talking and um, it has nothing to do with anything, but it's just a random thought. So while we're sharing ahas, and it was that 
Um, we ask people to do their best and we rarely ask people to be at their best. Hmm. And the, the thought that we are building a structure that will encourage people to be at their best because sometimes you can't do your best. Sometimes you're, you're in a pile of poo. Um, but we'll ask you to be at your, at the best that you can be in whatever moment you're in. And sometimes that's really low and that's okay. And we'll hold you there. Um, hold as in support, not hold, keep you there. Um, but it, it occurred to me that we ask people to do their best, but we really don't ask anyone to, to be at their best and, and give them the tools for that. We will come up with um, another time to meet. Um, what makes sense to you guys timing wise? Um, work, does a week work? What, what? So I am happy to meet every week. Uh, just want to let you know that I'm going to be gone three weeks, end of March into first week of April. So the last two weeks of March and the first week of April. Are you going someplace wonderful? When to come? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> there it is. I want to yeah. <laughs> yes, we are. We're going back to uh, Thailand and Malaysia. Oh, so oh wow. Yeah, it should be wonderful. Looking forward to it. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. So, but I can meet every week. Cool. Or twice a week if we need to in this initial phases. Now I'm pulling up my calendar. I have a very bad week next week. Um, it's, it's suddenly become grant season again. How did that happen? Yeah, I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> but the 13th and the 14th and the 15th and the 16th are all clear. 13 is beautiful for me. Um, is absolutely um, wide open. And, uh, or I could, yeah, I think that's, that's the day that would work for me. Does the 13th work for anybody else? You said yes for you, Anne. Yes. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm going to be at a meeting of um, an organization called Convergence. Their leadership is going to be in town. Cool. So I'm going to be at that meeting, and that's from 8.30 to 5 p.m. Holy moly. That's mm -hmm. a big meeting. It's a big awesome. meeting. That is a big meeting. Um, does the afternoon of the 14th work for you guys? Um, it works for me. I can do it, yeah. Okay. How about you, Laura? Yes, that works. I have a, I have a 5 o'clock appointment, so I might have to leave a little early to get to that. But okay. I have it until 4. Okay, so we could do one to four Pacific time. Mm -hmm. Two yeah. to five Rebecca and me time. Okay, let's do that. It's Valentine's Day. Oh, Aww, we can be with our loves. Be with the people we love. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that would be great. Very apropos. Awesome. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so one to four and two to five for Rebecca and me. Fabulous. It has been wonderful to be with you guys. And what's, what I'm looking forward to is um, from this point forward, I don't have to do all the talking. I had to do a lot of <laughs> sharing and presenting and giving you guys background and I get to step back. So uh, that will be nice. Well, thank you guys very, very, very much. This has um, been awesome. I'm looking forward to what's next. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good thank night. You.